Oh, hi, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians. You may have known that already, because maybe you've listened to this podcast a bunch, and that's amazing. But if you haven't listened to this podcast, what we do is we sit down with a folk musician. I ask really invasive, personal, vulnerable questions, and somehow they find it in themselves to answer, and we all learn something about ourselves. Today, so thrilled to be talking to Stella Schindler, who is one half of the Washington, D.C. area band Kentucky Avenue. Uh, Kentucky Avenue has been safely working on their sophomore album throughout the pandemic. Stella is an English teacher at an all-girls Catholic school and has led a transient path throughout her life, but music was always constant. She lived in a number of different places growing up, not living anywhere for more than two years, and it wasn't until she started teaching that she remained in one place, D.C. Because of all the moving around, she initially felt pretty shy about singing in front of her family. She tells a story about how her mom was actually pretty surprised when she first heard her perform publicly. Despite that, Stella's actually really connected to her family, particularly with her name. She's actually the fourth Stella in a row, And she talks about that connection and what it was like growing up having the name Stella. Stella speaks beautifully about the freedom and delight she felt when she first sang out loud. She is a joyful performer who makes the most eye contact I've ever seen from someone on stage. She's also a devoted Catholic who loves folk and country, but does enjoy that separation of church and state when it comes to music during the Mass. Her dad is a theologian and philosopher who encouraged Stella to follow her passions. He told her when she was thinking about college, he said, you can study anything, but with one condition, provided that it is not useful. She did follow his advice and majored in art history at Notre Dame. After college, she found herself in Omaha, Nebraska, moving there on a whim and working at a record store. This is where she had a very cool chance encounter with Bob Dylan right before she moved to Washington, D.C. and started that teaching job. Stella is an amazing person. I love listening to her talk and love hearing her sing. Hope you enjoy and also enjoy the thunderstorm rolling on in the background of this interview. Watch out for Kentucky Avenue's new album, Ballad of the Past, coming out this fall. We're going to listen to a brand new song of theirs called Record Playing Days, and then we will get to our conversation with Stella Schindler of Kentucky Avenue on Basic Book. Do you remember those record-playing days? Whitewash and Spanish moss vanish in the haze. Listening to love songs with the summer passing by. Needle drops, vinyl pops, there's fire in Crossing, trying to find my groove Skip ahead to what you said that night And made your move You said lay me down slow Okay, Stella Schindler, here we go Woo. Thanks for being on Basic Folk Well, thank you, Cindy I'm really happy to be here You are the fourth Stella in a row in your family um, who are the other Stellas, and what does it mean to you to like carry on that legacy of three other Stellas, and how you relate to your own name? Well, thank you. yeah, my um, my mom too. I think will appreciate that that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, she loves telling everybody that I'm uh, the fourth in a row. Um, so it comes. Um, my mom, my grandmother, and my great grandmother are all Stellas. And uh, my grandmother came from Lithuania, so it comes from a Lithuanian part of our um, history. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't have a lot of contact with my Lithuanian roots, um, other than I know that's where I came from. But I've had a lot of happy memories, I think, associated with my name. First of all, it was nice to always have a name that 
kind of stood out a little bit from my peers just growing up. And um, I guess I should, I might backtrack a little bit, you know, when I was really young, just thinking about this now, um, Stella seemed kind of like an old lady's name, but maybe I was, <laughs> you know, associating that with my grandmother. Um, and so it was a little, I guess, awkward if I really think way back. Um, but definitely when I got into high school, I loved kind of being the only Stella. And um, and then, of course, I uh, found out the name means star. And um, I just, uh, I love that image. My middle name is Marie. And so uh, it's a, an allusion to star of the sea. Um, Stella Morris, and, um, you know, there's something quite beautiful about that. Um, but I, there is a tie to my family that is really important and is a, a beautiful connection. And I think a lot of times the, the names of families a lot of times go through the ma male line, and it's really special to have something like that come through, you know, the female line in my family. Um, of course, uh, I probably can't go anywhere without <laughs> people screaming my name at the top of their lungs, <laughs> thinking they're Marlon Brando or something else. Um, and I have a cartoon actually, um, on a closet door, a friend gave me a New Yorker cartoon that was, um, uh, you know, and the caption was um, an Uber car named Desire, and it was the Uber driver standing outside of uh, a woman's window, you know, Stella. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was, um, so there's been some, you know, kind of fun things. And I, I will say, um, every single person who does scream my name at the top of their lungs uh, always follows it with, uh, I'm sure you haven't heard that one before, you know? <laughs> um, but I don't, it doesn't get old, but I, uh, but the name kind of stops with me. <laughs> um, you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I'm, there's no passing it along at this point. And, um, you know, I try to get my brothers and sisters who are having children to maybe entertain the thought of Stella, but, um, you know, that hasn't happened yet. We'll see. <laughs> Growing up, you lived in a number of different places. When you think back to that time before you left for college, what does home feel like and what was that place like? What did home feel like? Um, it didn't really feel like home, I guess. Um, I moved around uh, starting with my birth. I don't think I lived anywhere uh, for more than two years. Um, up through call even in college and afterwards I, I moved it wasn't until I started uh, teaching that I kind of settled in one place so you know I went to three different high schools in three different states um, you know there was a and even in those moves I was moving from you know mother to grandmother's house to my father's house and um, so you know as far as home as a place that definitely wasn't there. One thing I would say, though, is, you know, when I did go to a new place, I really did throw myself into it, you know, in terms of my friends and um, my school. Um, but I, there was always a kind of distance. I think with um, my home life, you know, I felt a kind of difference. But, you know, I think that that is also, it's not just because of the geographical moving, I think just all the emotional moving around. Mm. And, um, you know, I think that that factored into it too. Um, I love my family, but it certainly was, uh, you know, that was, that was hard. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you lived in your place now? So um, I live in Washington, D.C., and um, it's a place that I never in a million years ever thought I would end up. Like the most transient, transient you know, city in the yes. world. Yeah. And that, yeah, <laughs> you know, and this is where I uh, find some permanence. Yeah. Um, but I, I moved here uh, initially in 93 and then moved back out uh, and then came back in 99 to this area and, and basically been there since 
Um, I have lived, uh, yeah. So, I mean, in this particular apartment, um, this is what, six years now, uh, living in this place. So, um, it's kind of a record. Where was music in your young life? And, you know, you're the oldest, uh, sometimes, well, a lot of times younger siblings get cool music from their older siblings, but with this older sibling, like, where were you finding the, the stuff that you liked the most? So, you know, I will go on record um, that, yes, I think you're right. My younger siblings ha- have cool taste in music because of their older siblings. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think um, there, no one was actually, you know, I didn't really have musicians in my family, um, but I did, you know, music was always around, especially, I mean, classic rock, um, uh, the top 40 hits, you know, um, and listening to that um, on car drives. And my mother, you know, loved musicals also. And uh, I know she performed in her high school musicals and she would uh, often remember those and teach us some of those songs. And it was kind of a yearly practice that uh, one of the, you know, one of the only TV shows we could watch when we were growing up was, you know, The Sound of Music. And we could all, you know, it was just so, um, but... um, The classic rock, though, was, you know, that really was formative. um, And I have a lot of, from the radio, radio, aunts and uncles and, um, but the, but where all of this really started to um, be, just move me, I guess I could say is, um, there was a time when, and I would have been in probably second or third grade, we had, uh, at the time my father was, was, uh, teaching college and we would have, uh, college students live with us or babysit us or, you know, and, um, there was one woman in particular who could play the piano and play guitar and she played and she played a lot of kind of fun kid songs that we would, you know, she would teach us, but She also played Joni Mitchell and Carole King, and I just fell in love uh, with those songs. And so she taught me those, and I just remember, you know, here I was as a second or third grader, you know, singing singing these songs with her. And then jump forward a a couple of years later, um, when my my parents separated, we spent a lot when my, we spent some time with my dad during his visits. And that time was really spent a lot in the car going on really long drives. And he would put, there were kind of five cassette tapes um, that he would have in the car. And it was Elton John, Bob Marley, um, Bob, uh, Bob Dylan, of course, uh, Joni Mitchell and Carol King. And those five would just kind of go on, you know, on repeat. And so I just memorized all of those songs, you know? And so it was, um, you know, I would say those artists in particular had, uh, a pretty good, a pretty big influence, both in a songwriting sense and also singing, you know, music that really moved me Mm. and understanding what that what that was. Do you think it was because they were just being played so much or were you drawn to them for some other reason? Probably both. I mean, they were played so much because we were asking my dad, could we hear that again? (laughs) Um, you know, so, um, and he's probably pumped that you're like, you don't want to listen to like, you know, disco duck or whatever's going on. Right. (laughs) Exactly. You know, (laughs) you know, um, so I think that, uh, I just, but I, 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 I really imagined like the person singing the song, you know, I mean, just physically imagine, you know, their mouth moving and Mm. their heart sort of beating and, um, you know, really being part of that song. I think that's what all of those um, musicians, I mean, they are known for, 
you know, what they do and um, it's so much of who they are. And I think I, at a young age, I just, that really resonated with me. Mm. That's cool that you saw the the image of the singer. And I wonder if also you maybe were connecting with that musician and, and trying to, you know, trying to see yourself in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder, because I never, I, you know, I started to discover a voice, but I never did anything formally to cultivate that in the sense of, you know, as I'm growing up, like, didn't sing in choirs or take voice lessons mm. or, um, and in fact, I, I kept music. I mean, I would listen to it all the time, but this idea of singing in public, I kept it a little bit on the, on the down low, mm. um, especially from my family, I think. <laughs> Why is that? Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's interesting to think about that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, when I was at school, I remember just being, you know, on the, on the playground at recess, you know, and I would put on plays and sing, make up songs and get my friends and we would put on these shows and, um, but with my family, I just, it was like the, that frog in the, um, what is it? The Looney Tunes or one of the old cartoons, oh, you know, where frog, he's, hello, my darling. Yeah, you know, I don't remember the name of that. It's frog. a talking frog. Yeah. And then when he puts him on stage, like he says, you know, ribbit, you know, and I felt like <laughs> I was just ribbits, you know, with my family sometimes. And, um, I, you know, if I think about that and I, again, I, I, it, it's just the way it was. I mean, I like a lot of adult, you know, pre-adolescent and adolescent kids just, being very self-conscious, you know, and, but also not really feeling the freedom to sing my heart out in front of them. Mm. Like it, and not that it's not something they did, like that there was not, there's no rule against singing. There was no, you know, Mm. in fact, I think, you know, uh, that might come as a surprise or I don't know, but I, and maybe be, you know, if I look back and, and think of all the moving around and everything, there just wasn't sort of a ground, mm. uh, um, that I, you know, and I, I just, um, yeah. So it was just, it was kind of just a hidden, um, desire. And, you know, I do remember when, if the fa- you know, my family would go to the store or something, I would just sing it alone in the house at the top of my lungs, you know, or, out on the swing set at my grandmother's, you know, go out there and swing and sing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so I remember when I was in college and singing in college bands, my mom came to one of our shows we were playing, you know, graduation weekend. And, and I was part of this really fun band. One of my brothers was in it as well. And, you know, she just came up to me afterwards and said, where did this come from? (laughs) You know, so it was even kind of a surprise, um, for her, but, um, yeah, I just, so, I mean, I loved music. I mean, and we listened to it. I, you know, it wasn't like verboten or anything, but I think just the, my own personal relationship to it was something just sort of quietly cultivated. Oh, Stella. (laughs) <laughs> no, it's not, I'm not sad about it at all, actually, you know. Um, I mean, now my family is like head over heels about my music, yeah. you know. Um, they, they'll they do anything. Oh, uh, but little Stella. Travel, you know, but little Stella. Poor little Stella. I have my friend's parents, you know. I, I would sing in front of them. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> yes, I would. So when you were singing, how are you feeling about the act of singing, what did you like about it? What did you like about your voice? Mm. I mean, the first immediate word that just comes to mind is free. I felt free, you know, just, um, and there was a power in my voice and, and I did not, not that I felt like empowered, but there just, there was an expression there that I was probably, I mean, at the time I probably was not conscious of that. I, you know, never would have put it in these terms at that time, but, um, looking back just that freedom, I, um, and 
delight, mm. uh, you know, that I took um, in that freedom and just a kind of losing myself in it, you know, um, and, you know, that, that's, that is always um, soul enriching, you know, when you can lose yourself and self in something that, um, uh, that you're passionate about or lose yourself in something that's beautiful. You know, I really think that that's um, uh, so enriching and I, I'm so grateful hmm. to recognize that experience even from a young age. You know? We are getting a thunderstorm in D.C., right? We are. And actually, you know, I will tell you, um, there's supposed to maybe even be some tornadoes. So oh if you hear things blowing around, you know, that's, it's not you. I hear <laughs> it's like me. the Wicked Witch. Yeah. Of the West That's right. Songs. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Stella, what about writing your own songs? When did you start that? And what was your inspiration to start? And I'd also love to hear, since you were so shy about singing in front of your family, when did you start sharing your own songs with them? Yeah. Um, I mean, really, uh, that didn't come until college. I mean, just when I was actually singing in bands um and um and it wasn't i probably wrote my first re quote unquote real song you know probably my the last year of college um i was kind of in the thick of it then so i would say you know it, it took that long uh i mean i i would make up songs you know as i mentioned before you know on the on the recess playground and there was always that kind of creative outlet but I you know in terms of songwriting yeah I think it didn't really start until until college mm. um and it's interesting if I could you know uh, what what brought out even my voice even in college I think and why I just I finally kind of went in full full force during that time was, um, I had, during my, my sophomore year, I studied abroad, and I just remember um, when I would, one of the first, you know, in one of the first weeks, I remember going into, uh, we, I lived in a dorm, and this was in Innsbruck, Austria, and I uh, walked into kind of the community room, and there was clearly a party going on, and um, but it was awesome. It was just like, you know, tons of people and a couple of guitars, and people were singing. And um, you know, when I walked in, I thought, huh, I recognize these songs. You know, they're singing American folk songs and some classic rock, and you know, songs from the '60s and '70s. And um, you know, I knew all these songs, and and if they very graciously invited me to come over and um, I just started singing there and you know people were inviting me more and more to come and sing at these parties and it just um, it was such a beautiful way to connect with um, the people in my dorm and the people uh, there because you know these are uh, I didn't speak German very well. I mean, I hopefully improved a little while I was there, but, um, you know, it was a real point of, of connection and, um, and joy and just, uh, I loved every minute of it. And so when I got back to the States, I just, um, that's what I wanted to do. Sing, 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 sing. Um, and, and then of course that became more public that way. raised Catholic as a kid growing up, um, and it's still a very big part of your life, and Catholicism has its own musical experience. What has been your connection to music and faith for you, and how does that relate to being a, a Catholic? Such an interesting um, question. I mean, you know, as I mentioned before, I never really, I never, I grew up obviously going to church and um, 
I never sang in church choirs or anything like that, you know. Um, I would say a couple of things. First of all, you know, I mean, the the church has such a rich history of music, um, you know, throughout the centuries um, that has contributed just a lot of really beautiful things to the world. And also know. the priests um, sing, sing praying out loud. They're like the... Na, 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 yes, na, na, you know, da, da. that's right. <laughs> exactly, you know. Um, and I think it's... Um, I've, I've since learned, I think, that maybe St. Augustine didn't say this, but he's often attributed with saying that um, singing is praying twice. Um, you know, and I can understand why that is. And this is going to sound maybe really um, strange, but here goes. I mean, I actually, um, you know, I, I tend to sing, you know, folk music and, you know, country music and kind of bluesy music, I guess. And um, I actually don't like when that kind of music gets into the church in, into like a, a like the Sunday um, night youth service. Yes. You the know, ovation and guitar. It's not that. Right. <laughs> exactly. And I, you know, it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to sing along. It's not that I, but in terms of having, uh, you know, a, a sort of soul lifting experience, a lot, a lot of times the palestrina or these, um, polyphonic voices singing in Latin because there's already something in otherworldliness about that that um, I'm very attracted to. Uh, but, I mean, like I said, it's not... I definitely see the place. Um, I agree yeah. with you, and I'm wondering why that is. You know, I think... Because I think the overall tone of Catholicism matches more along the polyphonic... Uh, right. you know, giant choir of angels and, you know, giant right, organ right. that's like, you know, three feet, three stories tall, you know, like that. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, like kind yeah. of like a larger than life kind yeah. of situation. And then, you know, getting up there with a tambourine and an acoustic guitar, it's like. Yeah, I know. Something is weird about it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think, you know, when I've gone to. Um, a Spanish mass or an African mass or um, I'm trying to think of um, just another place where I've heard music that's actually the folk music, you know. A tambourine might come in on that and, and the guitar and all of that and for some reason that's, that's still different. Um, I mean, I, I actually gravitate more towards hmm. that than I do than like the ovation of guitar. And I, I, you know, maybe again, it's a little bit of otherworldliness for mm -hmm. me, you know, um, that I can tap into or, um, yeah, I, I need to kind of, I think, sit with that. Let's start a podcast about, a about that. You know, we could, <laughs> you know, church music. Church chat. Um, church chat is even better. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> But you know, I, I as I, as we're talking, it's making me think about um, just rethink your question a little bit about the relationship between faith and music and growing up Catholic. And you know, I um, I grew up. My father is a is a philosopher and a theologian, and um, he does a lot of writing um, about Catholicism and American culture. And you know, growing up with him. Uh, you know, he always had some uh, very countercultural things to say to us um, and advice to give us. And, um, you know, I think a lot of that I've kind of carried with me through the years. But one thing I would say about how my faith has influenced my music and maybe vice versa is that maybe more in the songwriting and what music and the experience of music is in and I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, my faith has, and, you know, just in being in the Catholic family, this idea of um, that the world is, is bigger than you are, first of all. The world is um, bigger than what you see, you know. I mean, there's 
Um, there are a lot of intangibles there um, that have shaped my life in ways that I can't measure per se, you know, and, you know, I think about, you know, goodness and truth and beauty um, that my faith has, has led me towards. And I think that um, the desire for those things and um, the experiences of being struck by those things and have, ha you know, having my life change as a result of those things, um, you know, I think that has sort of infiltrated, you know, my songwriting and just ha made me have a deeper relationship with music and, and what singing is and what it means to sing with people and for people. And, um, yeah, I, so I think, you know, outside of, you know, church music, I think my faith has really informed, um, you know, other aspects of mm. it too, I guess I would say. So we were talking about earlier how you were moving around quite a bit and you did not have like a typical or easy childhood. And how do you think your experience as a kid growing up shapes the way that you relate to the world, relate to others? And how do you think it's easy for you to connect with people? And how do you think it's hard? I think, I, you know, when I mentioned before that I would kind of throw myself into um, the new situations and the new schools and making new friends. There was something, especially as I got older, there was a way, you know, I think I viewed all of those things as, um, you know, I get to start over again, you know, and, and there can be something freeing about that. But it was always hard to leave a place. I mean, it, it never made it easy or easier but I think that kind of, um, yeah, just entering new places. I, I, it's funny because I don't know if it's a result of this or despite it, but, you know, throwing myself into the present situation, I, you know, I do think that that's what my approach was. Just I didn't think about it. I just mm. did it, you know. Um, but I think that uh, I don't, you know, it's made me, you know, I... I talk to strangers, you know, I, you know, I, I, I have a, you know, a, and I'm very comfortable, um, being by myself, um, traveling by myself or, um, it's not to say I, I don't get self-conscious about certain things or, um, you know, playing a solo gig is always a little bit nerve wracking, you know, um, when you ha hold the stage by yourself. Mm. <laughs> um, but, uh, in terms of, you know, getting to know people and, um, I love people. I love getting to know them. And, you know, that part has been, has been, again, I don't know if that's because of or despite <laughs> of my experience, but I, but I do put up walls, you know, I mean, I think that would just, it's sort of natural. I mean, there is a kind of fierce independence and, in, um, that I, that I had and have had over the years. I do think as I get older, you know, my, those walls come down just because you realize the importance of relationships and, you know, there's not a whole lot of time, <laughs> you know, to cultivate them as you get older. And, um, and also just learning the power of forgiveness and, um, you know, the healing parts of love and friendship. And, um, you know, I, being in the mo present moment, um, in, and being aware of the depth of meaning that is given to us all the time and, um, and through other people and, and conversations that we have with others. I mean, there's just so much out there. You've got to, to get those walls mm. down, you know, and, um, you know, that's not, you know, I, I, I do think as I've gotten older, um, I'm just much more aware of that, but, uh, definitely, um, I think I, always wanted to be the person that got to know somebody, but that sometimes wasn't the reverse, you yeah. know, or, you know, it wasn't reciprocated yeah. is what maybe I should say. Um, you're talking about your dad giving you some unorthodox advice. And I, um, read that he encouraged you to follow your passions when it came to higher education. He said, you can study anything with one condition provided it's not useful. 
right. <laughs> which is, <laughs> I read, I also read that that's something that you tell your students. So you followed that yes. advice and majored in art history at Notre Dame. Why did you find that advice and that path so valuable? Well, it's, you know, um, it's so funny. And I, I think that, you know, I, I continue to follow that, that path, you know, I, um, I went on and, and studied, um, I got a master's in the great books program, um, at St. John's college in Annapolis. And, um, and now I, uh, also, um, teach high school English and that's probably the most quote unquote practical thing that I ever did with my <laughs> life, but, um, or useful, but, uh, you know, I came a long way. It, it was a long time coming, getting to that point. But um, this idea of things being useless or not useful, you know, I think um, in at the time I was sort of like, oh, dad, <laughs> you know, um, just one, one of many things that he says to us like that, you know, um, but it always stuck with me because I realized just how countercultural that was. And I will say, though, it actually, in some ways, made life more difficult um, because, you know, I, I didn't grow up with and I certainly in my own personality didn't have this kind of career oriented backdrop or even own desire in my heart. You know, um, I was interested in a lot of things, but it was very amorphous. And um, one of the things that... Uh, you know, I started to get some direction. Um, I mean, I must have changed my major 80 <laughs> times, you know, when I was in college. Um, I mean, obviously, it's an exact. I think I changed it, all, in all honesty, maybe five times. Um, and I settled on art history, not because I wanted to be an art historian, but I, it's going to sound funny, but I, I stumbled on this uh, philosophy of art and aesthetics course. And I, all of, I just, and half of it was over my head, <laughs> but I thought, oh my gosh, you can study beauty. Like <laughs> what is beautiful and what do we mean by beauty? And I mean, and my heart and soul and imagine everything was just on mm. fire. And all of a sudden I had this direction and yet it wasn't a direction at all. You know, there's like, what do you do? You know, quote unquote, what do you do with that? You know, how is that going to, you know, what career do you, you know, uh, comes out of that? And um, it doesn't, but I just kept thinking, okay, this is not uh, what, I'm not studying this because of what I want to do in my life. I'm studying this because of who I want to be in my life, you know, and um, that's still an ongoing process, but um, but coming out of college when everybody was going to this internship and this career and this graduate school and all of that, I was just so lost. And I actually was lost for a long time. Um, but uh, music was being woven in and out of that. I mean, in some pretty major ways. Um, so, you know, I can say thanks, Dad, you know, for making my life better and worse. <laughs> For a little while, you know, but I do have to say when I tell my students that now I, they, you just watch their heads go explode <laughs> because they like no one would uh, ever yeah. tells them that, you know, everything is like you have to do this because of college. You have to do this yeah, because yeah. of this. You know, there's always some utilitarian thing at the end. And so, um, yeah, so it's uh, that was an interesting piece of advice. Can you tell the story of how you got your first guitar and how did you first connect with the instrument? Oh boy. So this is, you know, connected. It's a nice, like, I'm just going to continue <laughs> this story of, um, after college. Uh, so I had been in a college band and, um, we, uh, we all planned to maybe, maybe do something with this. And some of the guys that I was in the band with, including my brother, um, we were just thinking we would, you know, kind of keep this up and 
Um, I had thought about moving to uh, Chicago to maybe pursue, you know, I had no direction whatsoever. I just thought Chicago is the next big, big city, you know, we can go there. And um, I ended up um, going to Chicago. I didn't move there. I just went there for a visit and I had been invited to um, a party where there were going to be all these artists and poets and musicians. And, you know, I thought, oh, this is going to be wonderful, you know, and I got there and I don't know what happened. I can't pinpoint anything. It's just as soon as I walked in and I, and the whole time I was there and when I left and I, I can't explain it, but it just seemed like a, one of the emptiest places I had ever been. And I was, I was, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I really uh, was, to say the least, surprised by that, especially after everything I had been studying and all the joy and, you know, desire of wanting to play music. And it just, and, you know, maybe I, I don't know, it was just a weird, and part of me wonders if it was just fate <laughs> intervening and trying to steer me in another direction, you know? Um, and so I kind of, I really didn't know what I was going to do then. And um, I'm going to oversimplify it a little bit, but, you know, honestly, it was almost like this where I heard some people, I was passing some people who were having a conversation about Omaha, Nebraska. And as I walked by them, I said to myself, that's where I'm going. And I packed up my little Chevy white Nova I had at the time and, um, and drew, and went to Omaha, Nebraska. And I kind of started new there, you know? Um, and there were, what year was this? This would have been in 91. Wow. Way before the bright eyes. Yes. Scene. Oh yeah. <laughs> way before that. Yeah. So, um, Interestingly enough, I, when I moved to Omaha, I said to myself, okay, you're not supposed to do music. That was a big sign. You know, let's just, you're going there and you mean let's that, start that fresh. party was a big sign? Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. It was really, it, it shook me to my core. Wow. At that, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but so I, um, in Omaha though, and again, this is why I think fate has inter you know, had intervened or providence, you know, um, that uh, every person I met in the beginning was a musician or had something to do with music, <laughs> you know, had friends who were musicians. And, you know, I moved there kind of in the beginning of August, I guess it would have been. And by the end of August, uh, I had been invited to go to this Labor Day let's just call it a gathering of all these people um, right along, I mean, right along the Mississippi river in Iowa um, staying at, you know, there's someone had some relatives who had a house, a big house there with lots of land and everyone just bought, brought their instruments. Mm. Now at the time I played no instrument. I sang um, I mean, so I, my voice is an instrument. <laughs> you are an um, instrument. I am an instrument. I brought myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I, you know, we were, people were just, put, you know, writing songs together. It was a real, I mean, it was a very sort of communal um, music event. Um, and uh, someone had a guitar and just said, you know what? Um play, I'm giving you this guitar. I'm going to, you know, show you how to play a few chords. And he called them the chords of life, which is basically, uh, it's an E chord and then a modified A and a modified D. You don't have to move your fingers very much. Um, but it sounds really cool, especially if you are just kind of strumming along. And, um, and so I just started playing that and it was sort of like, woohoo, look at me. You know, I'm, um, I'm playing guitar and we, somebody started you know, writing some lyrics to that. And, you know, we just kind of had fun with it. Um, but then as soon as we got back to Omaha, that same uh, friend of mine said, you know, I saw a used guitar uh, in the guitar shop that has your name written all over it. And it was a very cheap guitar, but it had these floral designs over it, you know, and, it, and I, as soon as I saw it, I thought, yes, 
And um, it was very inexpensive, but the action on it was so high that, what is, you know, wait, my what does hands, that mean, the action? The, the strings from the fretboard were pretty far away. Oh, so and, when you're like um, pressing down, it's yes, pretty high. Yes, you know, yeah. I just, um, and my hand was sore and I have calluses everywhere, you know, but. No pain, I no gain. T- no, exactly. <laughs> that is exactly right. <laughs> and so I, um, uh, in, I was in Omaha for two years because, you know, the two year mark right. hit and I was supposed to move. <laughs> um, but in those two years, you know, I learned how to play guitar, taught myself a lot of, well, with the help of a lot of people showing me chords, wrote a bunch of songs and had two solo gigs under my belt, you know, um, and then I left, <laughs> which was, I don't know. I mean, you know, at the, when I left, I looked back thinking, Ooh, should I have left? But, um, you know, I'm so immersed now as, as the Robert Fro- Frost poem goes, you know, the pa- the road not taken, you can always, um, you know, as soon as way leads on to way, you know, your path really takes shape and, you know, it's, uh, hard to kind of imagine what life would be like if you had taken the other path. So, um, yeah. So you left Omaha, but you didn't leave without meeting Bob Dylan. Ah, you know that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Okay. Omaha is, has a special place in my heart because that is in fact where I met Bob Dylan. Um, so I got a job in a record store um, or as you might say, record store. Right. That's how I say um, it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, he was, he was going to be in Omaha, Nebraska. And of course it was the talk of the town and the talk of the record store, of course. And I had my tickets and I was working on a Friday night. My show was going to be Saturday night. And, um, I was, working at the counter that was right by the front door. And I lived in, this store is, uh, was right in the, uh, the area of the, of Omaha, they call the old market, which is where all the shops and clubs and art store the and hip. galleries and the hip kind of hip place. Town. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, the Adams kind Morgan of, lo- of Omaha. There you go. Of Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> you can, wow. You know your stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, so it was kind of a lull on a Friday night, you know, and one of our regulars, you know, whips open the door and yells, Stella, Stella, Bob Dylan's in the old market. And, um, you know, I just ran out. I didn't tell my manager. I just thought, oh my gosh, you know? So, uh, now the rest of the story, I have no idea how accurate my memory is, but I'm going to tell you what was going on in my memory because, or as my memory, you know, tells the story. And you're like 22 years old. Yeah. Uh, I would have been, uh, like, yeah, 20, 22. Yeah. And I walked out and honestly, it, I, it was like a ghost town. Nobody was on the streets and which is odd because everybody usually is on the streets, but it was around dinner time and people are kind of, there's a few people mulling around, but people are in the restaurants and, uh, in the bars. And so in my mind, I have this road, this street to myself. And I look up the street and I look down the street and no Bob Dylan. I thought, huh? So I start walking up the street and out of the, you know, way in the distance, I can see a hooded man or a man in a hooded sweatshirt, I should say, with another man next to him. And in my heart of hearts, I was like, that's him. I know it. I know that Um, frame. (laughs) You know, I know know that frame anywhere. (laughs) And um, he was walking and I was just watching, you know, from a distance and he was, he and this uh, friend of his or bodyguard or whoever it was, was, they were walking in and out of places. And I'm guessing, you know, trying to find a place to eat. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I just watched and watched and, and my heart is beating so fast and so hard because I thought, oh my gosh, here's the person, you know, it's Bob Dylan, you know, and am I actually going to be face to face with him? You know, I couldn't get my mind around <laughs> that. And, um, 
as he was walking closer to me, they, they kind of hung a left and went down uh, the block. And I thought, okay, Stella, if you, if you don't follow them, you're never going to meet up with, you know, you're never going to see him again, yeah. you know? Um, so I, I went, I turned the corner and I went to the end of the block. And just as I got to the end of the block, he was coming out of the restaurant across the street. So we both, we were facing each other across the street and he had a notebook in his hand and he waved me over and I was frozen, but somehow I got my legs to walk across that crosswalk. And, you know, I wish I could tell you that we had this very profound conversation, <laughs> um, but all I could, you know, he was actually the one to speak first and in his Dylan voice, you know, Hey, how's it going? And I said, uh, not, you know, not too bad. And he said, um, uh, I said, well, thanks for coming to Omaha. And he said, Hey, no problem. Are you coming to the show tomorrow night? And I said, yes. And he goes, great. And I, I think I was like in the second row or something. And I told him and he said, great, you know, we'll see you there. And I said, great. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, and, uh, we smiled at each other and, uh, I turned around to walk back to work and he went on his merry way. And by this time, when I got back to the, to the shop, you know, my, my manager was quite infuriated with the fact that I had just left and didn't tell anybody. Um, and so, uh, he said, you know, where in the world have you been? You know, or he, I think he asked in a much angrier way. Um, and I had, with all my delight, I said, talking to Bob freaking Dylan, you know? Um, and so he ran out the door to go find him. So, um, but out of all of that, I do, I actually did get a record signed by him. So I have his desire, desire right? Yeah. Yep. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Signed by the man himself. Do you remember anyway. what you were wearing? You know what? I don't. <laughs> I don't, I could probably I guess what he was I had wearing. these, I know, isn't that funny? It just, you know, it was all a blur, uh, but I do remember the streets being like a ghost town. I felt like this is like out of a movie, yeah, that's wild. you know, it was wild and who knows, maybe there were a lot of people, but I just, it's like those, you know, when you see your, your, the love of yeah. your life from across the room and that's the only per in a crowded room. And Dreamweaver comes maybe, on, you know, exactly. <laughs> You are an English teacher at a Catholic high school in D.C., Georgetown Visitation, an all-girls mm -hmm. high school. Yes. You have said about teaching and music, there have a lot of similarities, and you said you have to be mm -hmm. present to, to your students and you have to be present to your, to your audience, which mm -hmm. is, it's, they're both kind of like performing. Yeah. How do you find mm -hmm. performing on stage helps you get ready to be in front of a classroom and vice versa? Yeah. Which is harder. <laughs> you know, actually, what's harder, it, it, being on stage, actually. Um, I I don't know. It's a, uh, there's something, um, I feel really free when I'm in my classroom. Um, I've been doing it for so long, I think now. And, um, you know, I, there, I don't feel self-conscious in the way that I do with the music. And I, you know, I, I've actually, I've thought about that, um, over the years, why that is. Um, and I think there's a vulnerability with singing and playing these songs that I've written that, I mean, I, that I don't feel particular. It's not that I'm not vulnerable in the classroom. Like, I think I'm, I am myself. I am, but I just feel free to be and I, you know, I can respond very spontaneously to what goes on in the classroom. And, you know, you have to make, a, you know, a million decisions, you know, a day when you're up on the, up in front of your students. And, but um, with, with performing on stage, yeah, there's just, there's a little, there's something else. I, um, but yeah, I think there's just, there's something more vulnerable that I'm a little bit more, I mean, I, I will let go on stage, you know, for sure. Yeah. Um, but you're not like that's, standing in front of your students telling them, them all about your feelings. Right. You know, <laughs> um, exactly. 
you know, I'll play my, I'll play my songs, uh, for my students and I'll sit up in the classroom and it's, it's weird. It is kind of weird, you know, because yeah. they, you know, I think they, you know, we all have a concept of who our teacher is, you know, being up there. And, and then when they kind of chain, it's not, you know, they're, when you sing and you present these songs, you're kind of a different person up there, you know, um, not, they're just not used to it. But uh, one thing I will say about the students I have at this school, though, um, you know, I remember, like, if I saw a teacher, I'd want to, like, go hide in the next aisle or something, right? You know, <laughs> d- duck in. But these students, you know, I see them on the Metro or at the restaurant, you know, and, and I love it. Be the mesh you know, um, <laughs> and waving their arms and introducing me to people they're with. And, you know, so it's, um, I love that. And I, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that they feel comfortable uh, enough to, to do that. But, um, but they're, they're, they're good gals. Yeah, you, um, your students sometimes ask for you to play guitar. They sometimes come to your shows when it's all ages. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you see your impact on these kids when it comes to just being yourself and bringing your ident- identity as a musician into their school? I think they love it. I mean, I think, and I love it. I mean, I, and I've had a couple of, uh, moms, you know, come to me and say, you know, it's just so, it's so good for them to see this, you know, um, to see you kind of have a, and, and it's funny, it's, it's, it's really about like that you have a passion and you, and you pursue it, you know, um, and that means a lot to the parents, I think, of the, of my students. And the thing is, I mean, music is, you know, for most, if not all teenagers and for so many people, I mean, music is, is core, you know, and mm-hmm. music is, is so important. Um, and it, and your identity is wrapped up in it too, you know, what you like and who you don't like and, and, um, where you go see shows if you know, hopefully that will happen soon. But, um, that I think to have, you know, for them to see that I'm doing this and, and they may not even like, or even you know, be my kind of, the music I play, I guess is what I'm trying to say, may not be the kind of music they automatically listen to. Um, you know, I get a lot of people saying, my mom loves that song of yours, you know, but, um, uh, but they really appreciate when I, they can get a little glimpse of my humanity, I guess is maybe, you know, and, and my heart, right. Um, without being sentimental, without, sort of, you know, being their best buddies or whatever, you know, there is a, there is a community there and a sharing there that, that kind of transcends those Hmm. um, things. Kentucky Avenue is your band with Dave Reese and the backstory Mm -hmm. of the name is pretty amazing. Um, You were living in an apartment or you had a room in Bethesda. It was a group house. Mm -hmm. What is a group Mm -hmm. house? Like were you roommates? No, a group house. So it was, um, basically it was a house that had, um, a communal space, like kitchen, living room. And then there were, um, four bedrooms. Each of them had their own, had its own, um, bathroom. And so, and I didn't know any of the people when I moved in, you know, you just, you're sort of like professional roommates, I guess you would call it. Um, and you, and you would get to know them, of course, uh, and so it's just a group of people who live together, you know, in a house. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. So did you, um, do you want me to say? Sure. Yeah. It? <laughs> yes. I'll let you tell your own story. I could tell my story. <laughs> um, so this is, um, so, uh, yes, I had, I, when I first started teaching, I lived in this group house, um, in Bethesda and it was on. Uh, Kentucky Avenue. So that's important to know for this story. Anyway, jump ahead, <laughs> you know, 16, 15, 16 years. And, um, uh, I had, I had only lived in that house maybe two years and we all Again, had that to number because yes, two there years. you go. <laughs> yes. Um, that's funny. I know. I didn't think of that. Um, uh, but our landlord was selling the place to new owners. So we all had to leave. So, 
Um, anyway, you know, jump ahead 15 or 16 years and, um, Dave and I had just started to practice together. Um, and we, uh, you know, Dave invited, he and his family invited me over for dinner, um, and just said, you know, we're, um, we're living in a, in a, in a temporary place while our house is being, you know, uh, refinished in any way. Um, but it's a place we used to own. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, it's a little bit of a dump, but, you know, I'll, I'll give you the address and, um, you know, you can show up next Monday or whatever. So we go on practicing and, um, as we're packing up, I look at my text message where he sent me the address and I'm looking at it, looking at it. And I say, I held up the phone and this is where, this is your address. This is where you live now. And I said, oh my gosh, I lived there, you know, 15, 16 years ago until I got kicked out by new owners and he said who who owned your house you know who was the original owner I told him he said okay my wife and I were the ones who bought the house from that (laughs) owner so what it what we've discovered is you know lo and behold you know 15 years ago at that time I guess it's now 20 years ago yeah 19 years ago um Dave kicked out his future bandmate and he didn't even know it (laughs) That's so funny. So, yeah, you know, so, um, but then, you know, we just thought, and here this house was on Kentucky Avenue, and we just couldn't believe it. I mean, and so we just thought, oh, my gosh, we have a name for this band, and we have a story. Right. How cool is that, yeah. you know? Um, so, yeah, Kentucky Avenue. So you first met Dave in 2016, mm-hmm. and I'm going to go somewhere with this. And I don't think it's going to be where you think I'm going to go. But um, Ooh, okay. so you, Stella, were invited to sit in at a music event in your school. And it sounds like it was all parents, all like men, dads who had played yes. at these jams at the school before. Um, and I heard Dave tell the story where, he, you know, they were just like, hey, one of our teachers wants to come play with you guys. Is that cool? And he thought like a teacher at a all girls Catholic high school, like this lady's going to be a nun, you know, (laughs) and which is funny, but like, you know, it makes me think about how your identity as like a Catholic school teacher might live Mm -hmm. in this duality where like you are this authority, this role model of faith for your students, you know, you're an upstanding citizen, but you're also this like cool individual who doesn't exactly look the part. You have posters of Miles Davis and Gillian Welch in your classroom. Where does that exist for you? Um, you, My identity as a teacher and... Like there's like a duality of like you're a Catholic high school teacher, but you're also like a rock and roller. Yeah. Um, I actually don't see it as a duality at all. I mean, um, and, you know, this is what, you know, there's, there's all kinds of people in the faith. (laughs) Um, and you know, I'm not, yes, I'm, I teach at a Catholic school and I teach English. And so I think, um, uh, you know, I'm not beating them to death with rulers. I mean, gone are those days, you know, (laughs) um, but, um, I mean, I, I really, I see my role as a teacher, as a, as a teacher of literature and writing and, um, uh, is to open their, to open my students' eyes to beauty, to the human condition. I mean, that's what literature is all about. Right. And, and to try to lead them to paths of empathy and compassion. Um, and I, I don't mean those things in an, as in a sentimental way. I mean, you know, you are constant, if you really are reading literature, you're constantly immersing yourself in another person's life, you know, I mean, with every book that you read. And, you know, that's, you know, I want them to understand that and to be able to think about it and write about it in ways that is not just simply expressing themselves for their own sake, but also, you know, to be able to communicate that, um, to others, but, you know, but there's also, you know, 
this is, it's not just touchy feely kind of, um, <laughs> uh, English class. I mean, to analyze, um, thoughtfully, to think deeply about, um, a subject, you know, I, I want them to be struck by the world in order to change their lives for the better, you know? And so, you know, that's the role I feel that I have, mm. you know, not so much like indoctrinating them with something or, I mean, of course, you know, the whole environment that we are in is steeped in the Catholic faith, but also, I mean, our school has been around since 1799 and for American standards, that's a, that's kind of an old school, yeah. you know, and there's, <laughs> there's a rich history there. And, you know, one thing that's really amazing about that is ever since 1799, that school has always been an institution for women. Um, and I think that, too, is also mm. um, a pretty amazing um, feat, you know. Yeah. Uh, so there's a there's a lot of tradition and ghosts, you know, um, and uh, a lot at work, you know, teaching in a school like that. So I actually, I don't see a duality. And honestly, you know, I haven't come across one single person who hasn't been at the very least intrigued by those Miles Davis, Miles Davis <laughs> and Gillian Welch posters on my wall. Or, you know, I sometimes, pe you know, open house people come in and ask, is this a, is this an art classroom, music classroom? And, you know, that gives me a chance to talk about how... English kind of inca you know, encapsulates <laughs> it all. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, um, that's a great question. I love that question. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I have a few more questions left, okay. but I don't want to keep you too long. I'll give you a choice between these two. Do you want to talk about your stage presence or do you want to talk about your dark edge? Wow. Um, I've, I've been, I'm intrigued by both. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go with dark edge. Okay. <laughs> dark edge for 500, Cindy. <laughs> I've talked to you about this before where there's clearly like this sweetness and joy in your music and also like, when you are on stage, you are joyful and you have this like really incredible eye contact with the crowd. Like you're clearly like a person who loves to connect and you have a very like bright spirit about you. But there is this like dark edge to the music that you make. Like to me, you evoke artists like Elon Jewell, Gillian Welch, Joe Henry, mm. who have this kind of like grit, swampy, dirty sound. I hesitate to say like Tom Waits, who um, has a song named Kentucky Avenue, by the way. Right, of course. But like there's still something like if you all of a sudden were like, I'm going to cover Tom Waits, like early Tom Waits or something like that would make so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, do you hear that in your sound? And like what do you like about that aspect of music? And how do you see that fitting into to your aesthetic? I think, yeah, that's, um, first of all, Tom Waits was a huge influence on my songwriting. Um, I think the, also the, the thing that I want to say yeah. is like Gothic Americana. It, yeah. You know, um, when, with my solo, you, you know, writing the stuff that I've done as a solo artist, um, definitely has a darker edge. I think, um, the songs on distant hum, um, really lend themselves <laughs> to that description. And I think, um, but I think Kentucky Avenue, we have a few dark, dark ones in there too. What would I say about that? I think the, first of all, that's kind of the music I've been drawn to over the years. Um, and I like the sense of mystery, I think that comes with the darker edge and it's, you know, it's not, I'm not pessimistic. I'm not cynical, you know, but I, I do believe that life is mysterious, you know, and, you know, I think, you know, I'm always intrigued by the night sky, the moon and, um, you know, the stars and, you know, and spiders, something and spiders, <laughs> <laughs> but there's just the, the mad, the, the, the kind of 
Um, yeah, I, I think, and just what that evokes and just the depth of the imagination and the unknown and, you know, um, uh, and the unfamiliar, you know, tapping into those things, I think, um, uh, have just been, I guess, more creative, um, resources for me. I, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to answer that with any kind of certainty, but I, a lot of it is just being drawn to that kind mm. of music, you know? And I remember even when Dave and I started writing songs together, he, he, that was one of the descriptions he would use too. He's, Oh, you, you know, you're a dark girl, you know, mm. um, that's a, those songs are, you know, that would be the, the adjective being thrown around. Given but, the um, way you, take it, even the way you play guitar, it's got this like lonesome dust bowl. Yeah. Kind yes. of like far away sadness in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could also be that um, you know, I I taught myself and so I have a lot of bad habits <laughs> that I probably have to, you know, just uh taken along with me a lot, you know, over all these years. Um but uh yeah, I think I'm just, I'm drawn, I mean, you know, I'm drawn to kind of the tragic and the melancholic, not, not in a, again, not in a, in a maudlin way, but just, um, because there's mystery there, mm. you know? Um, yeah. So it's complex. I think that's what I would say. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about nicknames. Oh, and yes. Your family is really into <laughs> nicknames. Um, actually, uh, I think you maybe have four that I'm aware of, four nicknames, family nicknames. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about what you, they are. Sure. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't, it's totally fine. So and if, yeah. My favorite nicknames that your family calls you are sis and you have two mm -hmm. sisters. So you're not the only sis, but you're right, sis. Right. Everyone calls you sis <laughs> and Roz. I was sis for a long, I was a, the only sis for a long time though. That's true. Yeah. But it's like very adorable. And then your mom oh, also nice. calls you Roz. Yes. For I don't know why, but and it must be a strange reason. But I, yes, I think it always is. Listening to your family like call each other all these nicknames, like even like the kids have nicknames, you know, yes. and if they don't have nicknames, they will in five minutes, you know, and they'll, right. and they'll, and they'll, they'll each have nicknames, but it really builds like a sweetness and a closeness that is sometimes hard to cultivate in a family. I, I don't know if you know how that tradition started and why it's such a common practice yeah. for your family. It's definitely comes from my mom. I mean, my mom's side of the family, um, you know, I, all my cousins have nicknames on my mom's side of the family. Um, you know, I think it just started my mom and her sisters, especially, um, you know, they would just have funny words and funny ways of saying things. And I, I think they just kind of, yeah. It, and I think you hit it right spot on about that, that sort of uh, underscores just the, the playfulness, um, in the family, you know? And so, and I actually, if I could just kind of circle back to, you know, you, you brought up the idea of having maybe a hard life and all of that. And, you know, the one really beautiful thing that I am, no matter what happened in the past with all of that, you know, the, the gift that I have is, you know, all of my, my siblings, both full and half siblings who, you know, I think of them as my siblings, um, you know, the camaraderie we have and the closeness that we have is really, um, special mm. and, you know, uh, and there's seven of you, by the way, you, there's just, seven just of to us to get that yes. out there just yeah. for the record. There's a few of them. And there's, yes. And there's 13, um, I have 13 nieces and nephews, um, so far. And like you said, yes, the nicknames are abundant. Um, and it's, People who may meet our family, especially if they want to be somehow connected to our family, kind of have to get the family tree diagram out and, you know, understand. But like, because like you said, uh, oftentimes people have multiple nicknames. So it's like those <laughs> old um, Russian novels, you know, when each character has about 20 different names. Oh um, but hopefully ours are a little bit easier to memorize. Than, <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. Than Dostoevsky. <laughs> yeah. The new project, Kentucky Avenue, is working on a second album, and we're recording 
in early September, and this is coming out end of October, so things may change this time by the time this is out. Um, but making an album in a pandemic must have been pretty challenging for you. What was that experience been like for you, and what are you excited about with this new record? Yeah, so um, luck, luckily for us, we actually had um, uh, a lot of the foundational things with our recording finished before uh, the lockdown uh, occurred. So we had had, you know, we had all the the drum tracks and bass, um, the vocal, uh, the vocals and the um, guitars done. So uh, in some ways, things kind of kept trucking along as they would have, even if we weren't in, in a pandemic. I mean, there were some things we had to change. Um, so we had, uh, we already knew we were going to be uh, farming out uh some of our tracks for, uh, we have a, I have a friend in um, Kentucky who um, did banjo and, and pedal steel for us. Um, our producer had uh, a guy, a good friend of his, who, who put down all the piano and keyboard tracks. And these were all done remotely. So, you know, we could do that um, in the middle of lockdown. So those kinds of things. And then um, once, like, there was the, fa- the, the gradual reopening um, you know, we could get a person in here, you know, their fiddle player, and um, I could come in and redo the vocals, and Dave could come in and do the background vocals and things like that. So, um, you know, we were able just to piece it together like that. And um, uh, and then, of course, our engineer, producer, um, uh, magician, wizard, <laughs> uh, uh, put, to, put it all together, you know, and has been giving us the mixes and um, we're hoping to get a single out um, uh, by the end of, of September, actually. And then, yeah, we'll have the full album in the late fall. So um, we're so excited about it. it. It's a little different. This one is a little, um, it rocks out a little bit more, I think, than um, our a little bit more folky country folk um, album that we had uh, with our first one. Um, but I love, I what I love about this new album, you know, just now that we've been together for four years and we've been playing with some other musicians on a more regular basis, this album just, there's a, there's a real unity, I think, um, and a, and a, a, a unified sound that, you know, you can't help but have, I think, as you develop as a band and as artists. Mm. Um, I don't, I, I kind of think of this one as like maybe a little vintage, vintage rock, um, you know, uh, I know Dave and I, they're like the seventies Laurel Canyon feel mm. comes out, I think in some of the songs and, um, but, uh, but we managed to get some of the, the dark edge, I think in, in some of these songs too. So, but I, I'm really excited, uh, just to have, um, this new music come out and I've shared some of the new music with my students, just playing a couple of songs for them. And I know, um, they're excited about it too. So, and my family. But Great. Yeah. Do you have a title yet? Yes. It's called Ballad of the Past. Ah, Ballad of the Dark Past. The Ballad of the Dark Past. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stella, I've got a question for you. Are you okay. ready for the lightning round? Woohoo. Yes, I am. Okay. Bring it on, Sin. Here we go. First song you learned on the guitar. Uh, knocking on Heaven's Door. Karaoke song. Ooh, probably me and Bobby McGee. Dogs or cats or something else. Um, other people's dogs and cats. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is your coffee order? Oh, uh, it's just coffee with some half and half. Simple. Yeah. Not complicated. Not at all. Uh oh. And sometimes just plain, just black coffee, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Dark. Uh, yep, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Favorite junk food? Oh boy. Mm, French fries. Mm, good one. Yes. Favorite U.S. city? I don't even, I, I can't believe I actually paused <laughs> before I said that. <laughs> that should have just been French fries. Favorite U.S. city? Probably New York City. 
first album you bought with your own money? It might have been Prince. Wow. Yeah. That's a curveball. I know. Sorry. I mean, I don't know why I'm apologizing. But, uh... <laughs> first concert. Okay, you're going to... Uh, actually, I, it was either, I saw these two bands kind of one right after the other. My aunt took me. Uh, it was either um, The Cars or Lover Boy. Do you mean? Uh, <laughs> one of those is acceptable. Okay, but you know, you know who opened up for Lover Boy? Joan Jett. All right, that's pretty good. So, so technically, yes. Joan Jett. Yes. And just yes, leave it at exactly. that. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm not proud of the Lover Boy, but that's just what happened. I mean, facts yes. are facts. Exactly. Yeah. You can't deny the facts, Cindy. All right, high school English teacher. What was the last Uh-oh. book you read? Um, for my own pleasure, it was a- actually Wallace Stegner's *Angle of Repose*. I just read that about a month ago. Beatles or Rolling Stones? Oh boy, I'm actually going to go with the Rolling Stones. Of course you are. Yeah. Makes sense, because they're for the bad kids. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, flying or invisibility? Um, flying. Mm. I think I'd be more scared of flying, but I'm going to go with flying, because that's what I hope I would choose. Star Trek or... If you're, if you're invisible, you could you, you get tempted to do a lot of bad things to people. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. You know, like, remember Gollum and Lord of the Rings? Right. Yeah. Leads to so, leads to trouble. Yes, it does. Star Trek or Star Wars? Mm, I don't. I'm just probably not really either. Wow. I mean, I know. I mean, I love. You know what? I take that back. I I loved um, like Empire Strikes Back and Princess Leia and Han Solo and all those. Guys. Have you seen all like the Star back Wars? in then? No, I have not. Should we watch them right now? We could. Yeah. We should watch the new ones. The new ones are great. Oh, see, I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. Well, I got to give it a try. So I'll go with Star Wars. How's that? Great. Okay. Okay. All right, Stella, last question. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? I've been to a lot of beautiful places, and I say that with a lot of gratitude. <laughs> um, actually, the place that's, op- that's just popping in my head right now is... Um, there's so many places out west that are so beautiful. Um, being at Crater Lake in Oregon and um, on a very foggy day and being very disappointed and sort of in a blink of an eye, the fog dissipated and I was left with the view of Crater Lake and that blue, blue water. I mean, that was. I think because it came as such a gift, you know, because oh, I wow. didn't expect that. Um, so that ranks up there. But boy, I've seen, there's been so many beautiful places. Um, there's a lot of beauty out there, Cindy. Yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah. It's so, overwhelming and we're not going to see most of it. Nope, that's true. So, I like so, to end things on a downer. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We're at the end of the interview. I can't believe how good I did. You did a great job. Thank you. Wow. I'm so impressed. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for talking to me. It was a real pleasure. Oh, Cindy, honestly, thank you. It was great. And I just, I really enjoyed our conversation so much. So thank you. All the best. Basic Folk this week produced by Adam Corey. Lindsay Myers is our business manager. Thanks to Laura McCarthy for social media help. Alex Stanton of the band Townspeople does our music. Basic Folk is proud to be on the American Songwriter Podcast Network. You can find all of the episodes of Basic Folk, all 92 episodes, at my website, cindyhouse.net, or wherever you get podcasts. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please send it to a friend. Share. Delight. Share and delight in the sharing of this interview to others. Pass it on. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. (laughs) 